thanks to Hunting Clash for sponsoring this video. Find out more later on. Hey, 42 here. Sweat glands are a bit like politicians. Nobody likes them, but you have to admit they do do important work. Work like getting rid of toxins, banishing heavy metals, and generally keeping you cool. That's sweat glands, not politicians. At least, not in my constituency. But it turns out, there's an awful lot more to your sweaty secretions than detoxing and stopping you from dying from heat stroke. In fact, our smelly pits and glistening foreheads are the unsightly byproducts of an evolutionary adaption that helped us humans become the dominant species on planet Earth. Hunting Clash is an awesome progressive hunting game available on Android and iOS that's free to play by clicking on the link in the description below. It's packed full of breathtaking locations that offer a variety of testing hunting conditions. I found Namibia particularly challenging due to the sandstorms blocking my shots. There's also a huge selection of rare, location-specific animals. Hunting Clash is fast-paced. In fact, it doesn't take long to start leveling up and unlocking new regions and challenges. The best way to rank up fast is to improve your precision. The animals are all different sizes and some are much faster than others, so you need to be able to keep up with them and to aim quickly to get the perfect shot. My favourite part of the game is Duels, a PvP game mode that puts your sharpshooting skills against other players in a head-to-head -head hunting masterclass. Also, just my little tip, don't forget to constantly upgrade your weapon. Even a 2% accuracy improvement can be the difference between a win and a loss. So if you fancy yourself as a bit of a sharpshooter and you think you've got what it takes to outshoot me, then download Hunting Clash today using the link in the description below. Happy hunting! Sweat is made from the watery parts of our blood, and it contains a unique cocktail of molecules that act as markers for our sex, our health, our emotional state, and our diet. Since sweat starts out life as blood, any chemicals that are circulating through our veins can, in theory, end up in our sweat as well. That makes sweat analysis a good way of determining whether or not someone is under the influence of drugs or alcohol, and plenty of other things besides. One nurse in South Africa managed to turn her sweat red for her self-proclaimed fetish for red pigmented spicy tomato corn chips. Markers for diabetes, organ failure, and various cancers can also be found in our sweat, and sweat monitoring could bypass the need for invasive blood tests in medical diagnoses. Our bodies release sweat through two types of gland, eccrine glands and apocrine glands. Eccrine glands produce the salty stuff that drips from our pores when we work out or get too hot, and they're found pretty much everywhere. Now, I know sweat has a bit of a bad rep, but it's a lot more dignified than the solution several other animals have found to the problem of overheating. Storks and vultures, for example, crap all over their own legs to keep cool. Pit stains may be embarrassing, but you have to admit, they're better than shit stains. Sweating is one of our secret superpowers. It may be less glamorous than our big brains, tool use, and language, but our ability to stay cool is what allowed us to run, hunt, and generally survive on the hot African savanna. When our sweat evaporates, it takes heat energy from our bodies along with it, stopping us from overheating. Having only two legs puts us at a bit of a disadvantage when it comes to sprinting, but when it comes to distance running, the power of sweat gives us the upper hand. We may be tortoises compared to many of nature's natural hares, but there aren't too many animals out there that can run extreme distances anywhere near as fast as we humans can. Eventually, nature's sprinters get too hot and either die from heat stroke or need to stop to cool down. We, on the other hand, can maintain a steady pace for miles. Our ancestors, as well as a few modern hunter-gatherer tribes, used this ability as part of a strategy known as persistence hunting, slowly wearing down much faster prey 
to the point of exhaustion. Humans have a uniquely high density of sweat glands, and we produce around 400 to 700 milliliters of the stuff every day. If you live in a hot place, it could be as much as several liters. Just one square inch of skin contains around 650 sweat glands, which is 10 times more than even our closest chimpanzee relatives. We aren't the only ones who use evaporation to keep cool though. Hippos, for example, produce an oily red secretion on their skin, which also acts as a natural sunscreen and antibiotic. Horses are one of the only other animals to perspire as profusely as we do which is probably why they can outrun humans over long distances. Although, having said that, humans have won the annual Welsh 22-mile man versus horse race on two separate occasions. My, we Brits really do love a weird sport, don't we? How much you sweat depends on your size, sex, fitness, genetics, and even how hot the climate was where you grew up. It's no surprise that overweight people tend to produce more sweat because they have more trouble losing heat than thinner people. But paradoxically, fitter people usually sweat more often too. That's because muscle produces more heat than fat. And if you're constantly exposing your body to high intensity workouts, it learns to remove excessive heat more efficiently. In other words, more sweat. Our diets can have a huge impact on our sweat, not only in terms of its composition, but also how much sweat we produce. Ever wondered why you sweat when you eat spicy food? That's thanks to a pesky molecule by the name of capsicum, which reacts with temperature receptors in your mouth to trick your brain into thinking you're overheating. Hot food and drinks also stimulate our sweat glands. And if you're opting for a coffee, the caffeine in your drinks make you drip even more. For some people, excessive sweating is a real problem, whether it's due to an overactive thyroid, the menopause, diabetes, anxiety, or their genes. Others struggle to sweat at all, making them vulnerable to heat stroke. But whilst sweating is important for keeping us cool, the whole sweating detox theory is a total myth. Yes, sweat does contain small amounts of heavy metals and pollutants, but to have any significant impact on the concentration of those toxins in your blood, you would have to sweat out pretty much all of your blood plasma. Which would be great from a detox perspective, but would also come with the minor downside of causing you to shrivel up and die. While sweating can't offer the total body cleanse you might have hoped for, its importance in our revolution shouldn't be underestimated. For example, it's likely that we lost most of our body hair to maximize the area from which our sweat could evaporate. But then why did we keep any hair at all? It's thought that the hair on our heads helps prevent our brains from overheating. When you're on two legs, your head gets the biggest hit from the midday sun. Our eyebrows were probably useful for communication, and along with our eyelashes, we're able to protect our eyes from sweat, wind, and other debris. But what about the hair in our crotches and armpits? How the hell did that stuff get us an evolutionary upper hand? Well, to answer that question, we need to take a look at a second type of sweat gland. Have you ever been on your way to an interview or a date and felt an unwelcome sweaty surge in your underarms? You have your apocrine glands to thank for that. These glands produce a fatty and often smelly secretions that emanate from our armpits and groins from puberty onwards, and they respond to stress, pain, and arousal. In other words, they produce emotional sweat. Our eccrine glands respond to these things too, as anyone who's ever suffered from sweaty palms will know, but it's armpit sweat that tends to cause the most concern. Having said that, sweat itself doesn't smell. The smell we associate with sweat is actually the smell of bacteria farts. Allow me to explain. We tend not to worry too much about getting stinky shins or elbows, and that's because the watery sweat from our eccrine glands contains a lot of salt, which makes it really hard for bacteria to flourish in those areas. 
Apocrine sweat, on the other hand, contains less salt, and more of the tasty fats and amino acids that skin bacteria love. Nestled in the warm, moist nirvana of our skin folds, bacteria feast on those molecular morsels and release sulfurous digestive gases in the process. That might sound gross. Okay, it is kind of gross. But our unique body odors allow our bodies to communicate important information about our identity, health, and emotions. For example, we tend to be more put off by the smell of someone fighting an infection compared to healthy body odors, which helps us to naturally avoid people who might make us sick. Smell can be an indicator of non-infectious diseases too. Smelling bitter can be a sign of liver damage, smelling sweet could indicate diabetes, and smelling fishy might mean you have a metabolic disorder called trimophilaminuria, which is when your body is unable to break down certain proteins. Our lifestyle can have a big influence on our sweat as well. Eating too much red meat can make you smell of rotten eggs, and if you drank too much of an evening, you're likely to have a lingering tequila-like tang the following day. The secrets in our sweat can reveal much more about us than whether we've just been on a bender though. Those of us with particularly sensitive noses can smell emotions, especially fear. Seriously, whilst most of us don't know it, we can distinguish between the smell of sweat from someone watching a scary movie and someone watching a nature documentary, although some of those nature docs can get pretty intense too. The smell of fear is contagious, and in one study, volunteers who smelt the sweat of nervous skydivers showed an increase in neuronal activity in fear-associated regions of the brain. In fact, our eau de horreur can be so overpowering that it almost completely masks our natural scent, and experiments have shown that whilst people going into an interrogation room all carry their own unique aromas, they all come out smelling pretty much exactly the same. Our smell can even give away aspects of our personalities. When presented with an array of smelly t-shirts, women can recognize dominant male personalities, or even tell if a man is single from his sweaty scent alone. In general, single men tend to have stronger BO than those in relationships, which is thought to be linked to the higher levels of testosterone they produce compared to most partnered men. Or maybe single men just have lower standards of hygiene, which might be why they're single in the first place. Stronger BO doesn't necessarily put women off though. A derivative of testosterone found in male sweat called androstadenone is thought to increase female arousal, improve women's moods, and even alter their hormone levels. And although women are generally more sensitive to their partner's smell than men, the unconscious male brain can still glean information about a woman's fertility from her smell alone. And men are often more attracted to women at the most fertile stages of their monthly cycle. So why are we not all attracted to the same smells, and the same people for that matter? Well, it seems that some of our preferences actually come down to our genes, particularly those involved in our immune response. The major histocompatibility complex, or MHC, is a large, highly variable region in our DNA that allows our immune system to recognize our own cells and fight off any invaders. The same region also has a big influence over how we smell, and it turns out that most women prefer the smell of men with dissimilar MHC regions to their own. Which makes sense, because if you have a different immune system to your partner, your children are likely to be more resistant to infections. Having said all that, although women appear to be able to sniff out partner compatibility with the proficiency of a police sniffer dog on the trail of a meth head, men don't seem to exhibit the same immune profile preferences. And neither do women on hormonal contraceptives. In fact, if anything, women on the pill tend to prefer men with similar MHC genes, perhaps because of the pregnancy-mimicking hormonal changes caused by this medication. 
That's because, if you're pregnant, it makes sense for you to want to hang out with your close relatives, because they're more likely to help you with raising your children than a random stranger. We've been pretty heteronormative here so far, but there also seems to be some link between sexual orientation and our response to smell. For example, Homosexual men and heterosexual women react in the same way when they smell chemicals isolated from men's armpit sweat. And homosexual women show similar brain activity to heterosexual men when inhaling certain female fragrances. Although whether this is down to innate preference or previous experience is hard to tell. The role of smell in physical attraction has inevitably been snapped up by the online dating market, thanks to what I can only describe as one of the greatest inventions of the 21st century. For the small fee of just $25, you can find your match through mail order smell dating service. Yeah. If, for some strange reason, you don't like the sound of smelling strangers on the internet, you can always partner up in person at a pheromone party, where participants anonymously exchange smelly t-shirts until they find the perfect smelly match. If sniffing dirty t-shirts isn't the perfect way to kick off a lifelong, totally not weird relationship, then I don't know what is. So. Is love truly in the bio-infused air? Maybe, but there's one problem. We still haven't found concrete evidence that human pheromones actually exist. True pheromones are like hormones that act outside the body and produce a predictable physiological response amongst all members of a species. So although your partner's smelly t-shirt might relax you or really turn you on, the same response can't be guaranteed from everyone else who takes a whiff. That said, our sense of smell is still extremely important when it comes to close relationships, and people who've lost it often complain about a lack of sex drive and general problems in the bedroom. But here's an interesting question. If our body odors are so important, why do we collectively spend billions of dollars every year doing everything in our power to cover them up. By killing the bacteria on our skin, deodorants prevent skin microbes from breaking down the chemicals in your sweat, whilst antiperspirants literally block your sweat pores and prevent the stuff from getting out in the first place, meaning you probably have to go pretty deep into the dating rabbit hole to find out your prospective partner's true smell, and by then it's probably too late. By muting our smells, we might also be muting the chemical communications that tell other people when we're sick, scared, or single. Who knows, perhaps our obsession with hygiene products is preventing us from finding our soulmates, and is behind rising divorce rates and decreasing sexual satisfaction. Is it time we all started a global ditch the deodorant revolution? Nah. Thanks for watching. Thanks again to Hunting Clash for sponsoring this video. Don't forget to use the special link in the description below to download and play Hunting Clash today. You won't regret it.